how can you do this at scale? So um, <clears throat> let's think about applications for a few minutes. You could imagine trying to deliver the right content to somebody. Which game do they really want to play? You can imagine trying to choose a layout. Should this thing be in the middle or on the right or on, on top, whatever? Uh, you can imagine trying to choose the right piece of art that goes with um, a vacation to Hawaii. You can imagine uh, trying to nudge people into developing healthy habits. These kinds of techniques have been applied there quite successfully many times. You can imagine trying to improve the way you respond to questions uh, in a bot framework um, and make it so that people actually get the information they need so they can you know, move on with their lives. All right, so, so these are all the kinds of applications that we're thinking about. Ways, situations where you want to personalize based upon these characteristics or concerns that people have. Uh, and now, um, how do you do this? So the baseline approach is supervised learning. So I'm just going to go through what supervised learning is pretty fast. Who here is familiar with supervised learning? Most people. All right, so in supervised learning, what happens is you have, you have a set of unlabeled data. You hire editors. They label the data. You take your labeled data, and you shove this into your supervised learner. And then you get out a, a classifier. And that classifier uh, predicts which class label corresponds to the input. Okay, so this is the standard way that people use supervised learning. And supervised learning, of course, has had great successes. So let's try to apply this to news. News, I think, is, is a particularly extreme case, both, both because uh, news is very non-stationary, which is challenging, and because it's something where we've applied these kinds of techniques before creating the service so everybody can apply these techniques. So in news, what happens is somebody comes to a website. You have a set of news articles that you might want to recommend to them. Uh, the computer chooses some news article to recommend, and then they either read it or they don't read it. Or maybe they click on it or they don't click on it. Um, okay, so you try to apply supervised learning to this, and it turns out that it fails. And I'm not telling you this just because, uh, I'm telling you this because I've experienced this multiple times at multiple companies. Um, it, it really does fail. And now the question is, why does it fail? And there's actually several different reasons why this fails, which this service is designed to address. So I want to go through these a little bit. <clears throat> uh, interesting. So, uh, yeah. OK, so you have your people with all their concerns. You try to solve this with supervised learning. You hire people to label things. They train a model. They integrate it. They do an A-B test to see if the model is better than what they already have. You get some performance. You uh, do this again and again and again. And it ends up being a lot of work. That's, that's kind of the really core issue with a lot of supervised learning. Because the problem changes over time. right? And because the problem is changing over time, you, you're never done. You, never, you just you keep doing more and more work, trying to get things to work. OK, so that, that's, that's cool. but uh, Or maybe it's not cool. It's cool for us. Uh, there's a more fundamental issues that I think are underlie this. So I would claim that you can try to apply supervised learning to this problem. It will not work very well. Uh, you might be able to get some modest improvements. Uh, but there's a really fundamental issues behind why it requires so much work and why you have to run that A-B test. And if we can address these more fundamental issues, we can actually solve a new, a new scope of problems that we couldn't previously solve. So I want to tell you what these more fundamental issues are. So one thing is, can an editor tell whether or not I'm interested in a news article about Ukraine? Um, tough to say. Hard to imagine that an editor could actually do that, certainly not in any kind of scalable way. It turns out my wife is from Ukraine, and so I would be interested in a news article about Ukraine. Right, so you need to get that, the right signal. You cannot get that from an editor in many cases. 
You need to actually get that from interacting with the world. <clears throat> Another common problem that happens if you try to interact with the world is you try to do impossible things. So maybe you ask yourself, what is the probability of click on a food article if you displayed space articles? Right, so this, is, this is a common issue that comes up. You, you have some content, you display that content, and now you want to predict the probability of click on some new content, which you've never previously displayed. Right? Um, it turns out that uh, you can't do this very well. Um, you run into these self-fulfilling prophecy types of problems. Right? So um, Ed has a great story. You want to, you want to tell your story? Oh, which one? The, the, the toilet seats. Oh, the toilet seats. It's actually a true one. Uh, so I, you know, as any mere mortal, I had to fix a toilet seat once. I bought one at a very common shopping store. It arrived the next morning. And now I'm getting all the time offers about toilet seats. And you must check out these new toilet seats and the best toilet seat for you. And um, it's the, it's a supervised learning algorithm will pick on this event and go like, there's a real something there, and look, we're showing more, and if you click by accident, there's more data if you click by accident, and so, oh my, like, this is a thing. And that's a self-fulfilling prophecy in a way. <laughs> yeah. So we need a system which actually avoids self-fulfilling prophecy problems, which actively deals with this. The self-fulfilling prophecy problem is really a much more fundamental thing. It's, it's about causation versus correlation, right? You clicked on a space article or a toilet seat in the past, and now uh, that's what you're going to do in the future. But it's not necessarily true. You really, it's a causality which matters. <clears throat> All right, so the last one, which I think is really important in news and in many uh, applications, is, is the problem changes over time. So we, we did this on MSN. We deployed this kind of system on MSN. It worked. It was great. It gave great improvement. And then we were kind of like, hmm. What would happen if we took an, a model that was a day old and used that instead? And the answer is you lose about 25%. What if we took a model that was two days old and used that instead? Yeah, you lose about half. This is half the value that you add um, on top of the baseline system. So it matters a lot whether or not you can learn in real time uh, when the world is non-stationary. OK, so can we optimize for the best outcome amongst a given set of choices for what matters to you personally without the self-fulfilling prophecy problem using real-time or near real-time online learning in a transparent way? You can actually see, like you as a developer can see which features matter and start adding new features that are similar that might also give you more information? Uh, and can we do this in a way which allows self-tuning to optimize the overall performance? So this seems like a, a large laundry list, particularly because it's, uh, it's quite a delta away from supervised learning, at least the standard supervised learning most people are familiar with. But it turns out that um, you can do this. So there is this reinforcement learning paradigm. This is a, another paradigm within the overall uh, area of machine learning. It's a heavily researched area. It's something I've been working on for, I guess, almost 20 years now. Um, yeah, it'll be 20 years this summer. All right, so in reinforcement learning, what happens is you have an observation that comes from the world. You, uh, you have your learning agent that needs to make a decision amongst several different possible actions. It chooses that action, and then later you get a report about the reward. Okay, and then the goal is very simple, it's just to maximize the sum of rewards. Now, in all truth, reinforcement learning is not as advanced in terms of the research as supervised learning. But there is a piece that is as, as advanced as supervised learning. And that's the piece that we're going to expose to the personalization service. Ed? Sure, thanks, John. So hi, I'm uh, Ed uh, Jaszierski from, uh, uh, from the Cognitive Services team in the Azure product group. Um, and John uh, from research, it was, you can see the difference in slides now, right? Being from the product group, it'll be a little bit more graphic. And we convinced John to move away from Times New Roman. So, uh, <laughs> 
So let's say, how, how do we apply this paradigm of choosing the, the right action in the right context and evolving over time in a product? And how do we apply that to personalization? So what we've boiled this down to is showing the right thing to the right person in the right context. So let's say you have an application where you need to show something or decide to do something. As John was saying, like it could be changing the layout, choosing the right response of a chatbot, changing the tone of response of a chatbot. Anytime you want to do something that you think will vary user behavior to achieve an outcome or a mission that you're trying to get to. So let's say here we want to show an action that your uh, user could do. And there's, there's a place where you'll display that, and they'll choose to act on it or not. And uh, there's many factors affecting that. And let's say that their choices here are whether they will play a game, watch a mixer stream of some celebrity gamer online, or just join a, a group that's, uh, that's happening somewhere and start chatting. Um, you see here the reinforcement learning paradigm now starting to take shape, right? You're, you're going to take an action. You have a set of choices. There's some contextual data that you could use. So we boiled this down in the personalizer API to one API call, which basically gets one big JSON for your context, a JSON in which you determine the schema and the attributes and the labels. And those can change over time, and it really adapts to your scenario. Um, uh, the, the icons there give some examples, but what is context information? It could include a location time of day, day of week. Um, this is an Xbox example, so maybe what friends are, are online or whether my most favorited friend is online or not. Any variable, any feature that you think might affect user behavior, you can throw in there, right? And all of these are like working hypotheses. Uh, they don't have to be perfect. And then you have a set of options uh, that you know, the, action could, the, the user could take. Each one of them is called an action. And each one of these actions, in turn, will have their own features and data. For example, last uh, time they played versus uh, last time they watched a uh, mixer stream, uh, whether the mixer stream is of a game they've recently purchased online content for or not. Again, editors can have smart ideas of what information might um, affect user behavior, um, but they don't have to get it right up front, and they don't have to label data up front to, to get there. They, you can start putting whatever attributes you think matter. So you call, make one API call, which is called rank. And rank is basically a, uh, a glorified sort by AI, right? where you, you have these options, one, two, three, and the context, and it'll return the ID of the one you should cho uh, show to the user. right? So it says here, oh, you should show to the user the join button. So we think you'll like to join this group. And then uh, you will, the user will uh, behave in some way, right? Uh, maybe immediately, maybe over some minutes, sometimes maybe over days. And your business logic, your own telemetry, your own code, will determine how well the user behavior is mapping to uh, the mission that you're trying to achieve, right? If my mission is to say, hey, I want them to stay more time online, we could have a uh, reward that says they stayed for another 10 minutes, right? If our uh, mission is to say they try out new things of Xbox they haven't tried before, well, maybe it's one reward point for every th th new thing they try. Essentially, you write the business logic that matters to reduce this to a number between 0 and 1. right? And then you call our second API call, which is reward, which takes a float. right? So rank things with context, tells you which thing to use. Stuff happens in the real world, very unpredictable and simulatable stuff, and then you get our reward. And that is basically the boiled down reinforcement learning essence of this service. Uh, let me see here. Uh, and the thing is, like uh, John was saying, uh, it's like Cookie Monster, right? It wants its cookies. You keep giving it reward cookies, and it will try to do whatever it can to map the right context features and the right action features to find what will be the best for users. And I'll do that both trying out things uh, that it's known worked and something that John will be uh, going into later called Explore Exploit. So let's go into code for a little bit. Um, here are um, two pieces of code uh, to show you what we mean by saying, hey, you have actions with attributes and uh, context with attributes. This is from our code samples, and they're like on GitHub. And, um, 
it just shows that, for example, for an, an, an action, you will have an ID, right, which is what the service returns uh, when it tells you what to use. And then you can have basically a list of objects. And like typically in a business system, let's say you're doing this new site, for the um, features for an article might be how many days or hours ago was it published? Is it about topic X or topic Y? Um, does it talk about location A or B? Um, does it come, is it controversial? Does it have certain sentiment? So you will have some features that come from an editorial database, your CMS, some features that might come from your click history and the statistics that your own system is collecting. Um, we are even working with customers that are getting uh, features from cognitive services. So you've seen the other cognitive services like a text analytics, for example, right? Where you give the API some strings, some paragraphs, and it'll come back saying, here's the entities, here's the sentiment, and things like that. Well, it does seem like useful things that might affect personalization, right? So why don't you throw them in there? And um, one thing I wanted to note here is, for example, each action might have different attributes at different points in time. These attributes can be sparse. Um, same thing for the context, right? And let's say you're doing a video app. What you choose to watch might vary based on the time of day, the day of the week. Is it commute time? If there's a mobile app, is the user moving or is the user stationary? Do they have 80% battery or 15% battery? Whatever you think as an editor might change user behavior, you start putting in there. And over time, it'll evolve because you'll learn things about your users. But um, we start with a very, very, very open canvas. So let me go here for a second. And um, one of the things that um, I wanted to show here is a simple interactive demo. You can also try it out yourself, where we're pretending to be a new site. And um, we see here what the request would be for the API. And here we have very simple uh, features like that are just a work week, time of day, and weather. We call this personalization. So you go like, where's the person there? Well, you can also send your user ID. You can also send your user segments. You could also send your, like, your most purchased category, right? Whatever you think are features of the context and of this user that matter. But it doesn't have to stick to the user. It can go beyond that. Um, here, I love, like a lot of people ask us, how do I personalize for anonymous people that are just w uh, visiting my website? Well, you start scrounging features from wherever you can. Like, so here, there's a simple example that looks at the user agent, you know, HTTP header, transforms that into some features, and maybe you know, whether I'm uh, on a Windows machine or not will change my choice of article. Um, you can also start using you know, GIP, you know, Azure Front Door, a lot of other things that augment the requests. Uh, for you. And same thing for the actions, right? You have, let's say, five actions. Here we have five articles that are possible, each one of them with features that our imaginary editors thought mattered. And then, hey, what happens if I start adding all these other features that could matter to the user? And the AI algorithm will start picking correlations between them um, as, it, as, it, as it can. So if we click a show a personalized article, we'll call the API with these things on the right, right, the context and the action. It'll make a choice. We will display it. And here we've defined that what we consider success is that the user is kind of reading it pretty fast. So we just coded some JavaScript to like look at how far the user scrolls. And we're going to use that as a proxy for the sort of engagement we want. right? So you see here, after a time limit of 15 seconds, we expect very fast readers on this website. Um, you should have scrolled to the bottom. And once you get a reward of one, it gets sent, right? And if the user just happened to w open up the article and just walked away, whatever, well, they didn't scroll to the end. We don't get a reward. And um, a reward of zero gets applied, because that's our, that's our policy. John is going to be talking more about uh, exploring and using the learn model in a, se in a second. Um, let me see here. Where were we? We were here. So let's look a little bit at the settings of the service. And this is. Um, the public preview is launching now, like here at Build. It's a now-ish, you know, things like kind of like getting out there slowly, slowly, bit by bit. I can tell you that right now, if you try to go to Azure and create it, you'll get an error. Just breathe in, breathe out, give it a, give it a day, and until all the systems percolate to the outside world, um, then it will be working just fine. So let, can you see in the back the settings on there, kind of? So I'll, I'll talk them through. This is essentially all the settings you have to uh, control to use a service. 
we tried making this not into like the control panel of the submarine, right? Where it's like, oh, what are all these things? It's very simple. It starts with rewards. So we said that we would rank and we would get an action to show, and then we would send a reward. The reward could come 15 seconds later, three days later, right? If it's a mailing campaign and you don't get clicks until three days later. So the first thing you said is like, how long are you willing to wait for a reward for an event, right? The second thing that you say is, well, if we never get a uh, reward API call for that event ID, uh, what should I use? Typically zero, right? It's like, don't learn with this. Third parameter, uh, sorry, configuration setting is if you get many reward calls, what should you, you do with them? And right now we allow you to choose the earliest one or sum them, right? It's like a way to aggregate many reward calls. The next setting is a percentage of traffic to invest, or traffic or uh, reward calls to invest in exploration, which is uh, when we use something different than the learn model to make uh, the decision. And John will be explaining that shortly. But here's a slider, you just go back and forth. And then the next setting is how often d does a model get updated in your inference? And this is because, as John was saying, like we have all these events on these rewards. We are training the model on every single event in near real time, right? And in an example of a news site, you can, you can imagine that breaking news, something happening somewhere, a celebrity visiting somewhere, um, that sways the correlations of features a lot. And um, so for example, in our in news applications, John, correct me if I'm wrong, you were updating a live model every 15 minutes. Five minutes. Five minutes. He won up to me. So um, every five minutes, uh, the new model was getting pushed out with the learning from the previous 15, was it, or something like that? I mean, it's, it's combining the learnings of the previous weeks. Oh, okay. But because it, but the update rule is online, so you're just snapshotting the state mm -hmm. of an right. evolving system. So imagine a new site that's putting out a new model every five minutes. Here's where you set that, right? If you have a more slower cadence of users and you don't want to be like super biased to what happens in the morning versus the afternoon, you could set up update, you know, frequency of 24 hours one day. Um, and then finally, we store the data uh, for a while that you send, all those JSONs, you know, the, from the actions and the context. We save them for amount of days you specify there for data retention to do some very cool tricks we're going to show you in a second. And you said there, uh, how long should those be saved for? Um, we're going to talk about evaluations in a second, but this is what it looks like in the, um, in the portal. And then um, this is also what it looks like in the portal at least in our pre-production environment uh, right now, you'll see it soon, um, where we tell you which features matter more or less. So, you know, we said, okay, just throw stuff at it, right? We, I just told you, hey, throw this attribute, this attribute. And you're like, okay, what, how do we know we're not really adding noise to the AI and the machine learning versus generating value? Well, we can introspect and explain the model in terms of the important, relative importance of features and we can tell you, for example, hey, the video length is playing a strong role in uh, whether, whether people are choosing something and getting good rewards. Um, as opposed to resolution 4K, that seems to be playing really no bearing on what users choose. And this is very insightful for the human discussion loop, right? Because now you can work with your editors and saying like, look, every user we talk to says they really choose a video based on 4K or not, but your machine learning algorithm says that Nobody cares about it. What's happening? Well, oh, you know, we just realized our mobile app doesn't tell you whether it's a 4K video or not in the UI, right? So, oh, you're discovering improvements in your UI that you could do, and like, um, you know, taking, also getting rid of the bad attributes that are not adding value, and getting creative about how to add more of the good ones. This is also very important for um, all sorts of like responsible use and ethic purposes, because you want to make sure that the attributes that are being used and are being weighed on are the ones that you would want users to know that they are being weighed on. Um, so we talked about the interactive demo. And um, let me see here. And so there's a, a couple of examples we have up on GitHub. So one of them is just like a simple hello world quick start, you know, command line app. We have the website I just showed you, which is more interactive. We have a chat bot that instead of saying, oh, you would like a coffee, there's mocha, cappuccino, espresso, latte, or you want a coffee, there's mocha, cappuccino, espresso, latte every time, learns what to offer. And if you say, I'd like a coffee, it goes like, how about a cappuccino right now? Or something else. And if you say, oh, yeah, that's good, 
it keeps learning your top preference. So it's a much more fluid discussion. And we also have the code to use the text analytics from the cognitive services as features into Personalizer. And um, we'll be showing our common usage patterns out there. So if you go out there and you would like to see something, please comment, add, and, or add things into our user voice. Um, let me check time here. The code I was going to show in Visual Studio was essentially the same JSONs being packed up and sent into a rank call. Uh, I'll just show you what that looks like to uh, make sure that it is um, you know, clear. Right? So I mentioned there's uh, one call called rank. And come on. Here you go. Right? So you create a rank request, right? This is a typical pattern for these sort of services. And you send the array of actions, the list of objects for the current context. There's some extra parameters there for actions you want to exclude, nothing to worry about right now, and an event ID, right? And um, you call rank, and you get a response. And then um, here, let me just turn on. Uh, well, doo -doo -doo. So here we use a simulated user to like return a response, and what I mean by a simulated user is like, like Mary likes uh, you know tweet pasta on Monday mornings, right? That sort of stuff. And then we just call reward API with the event ID and the re reward request on that float, right? I mean, as far as APIs go, this, this is pretty darn simple. Um, let's go a little bit into how it works behind the scenes. I think this creates a good mental model. Um, so you know the API now, right? And we talked about how the model updates. So what happens is that every time you make a rank call, the, there's an inference and an exploration <laughs> policy that takes play. And it returns the action ranking with the reward action ID of the action you want. And that happens super fast, right? And it's designed, it's used in very high um, throughput websites. So there's, the latency there is mostly IO bound, right? The compute is, is super light. Um, and we even give you a container that you can call locally in your compute, so you don't have to go across the web for a rank call and come back. Um, so that gets returned as a string. You, you, you measure user behavior. You send a reward back. And then when we did the inference, we packed all those JSONs and put them in an event hub towards the back end. When you send the reward, we put it in an event hub towards the back end. Then in the Azure Cloud, we take those two events. We correlate them by user ID. Right Now we have what we tried and the reward, it gets joined. There's some logs for the time period you specified. And the trainer service is constantly running, updating a model. And every x time that was that parameter that you saw in the portal, the new model gets copied onto uh, the clients. Right? And this happens whether you are running in the Azure cloud, just calling the rank and reward calls via the HTTP over the wire, or whether you're hosting the local container and you're calling it locally, this thing is pushing the events back to the Azure Cloud via Event Hub and then sniffing in a model every, whatever, 15 minutes, let's say, uh, to run. All right, does this help um, get a picture of the system? So we did this. And I'll turn to John now. And like uh, John was being extra humble, he actually, if you look at his papers online, he's uh, authored and given a lot of uh, courses on this sort of stuff. And uh, the research has been really great. I, I think one of the things I've enjoyed about this project is that we decided, like the whole typical traditional model of tech transfer, that research over here and product over there doesn't really scale to the times of you know, te this technology days that we're on AI time, right? So we created one team virtually. Everybody has their specialties. But we have one backlog, one stand up. And uh, you know, everybody's contributing into the same thing. And we try to make the products good sandbox for advanced research. And the research tries to help the products have a stream of little AI innovations that you'll be seeing in the product come over time. So it's been, it's been an honor to work with you. Thanks, Ed. Yeah. All right, so I want to give you a little bit of sense of how the reinforcement learning works. And then I also want to tell you a superpower compared to what you commonly encounter in the world. So in reinforcement learning, you have a policy. It's a policy which is choosing which actions to take. This policy can kind of exploit what it knows, trying to take the best action given the information that it has. Uh, or it can try to explore and try alternatives. So all reinforcement learning algorithms try to balance this trade-off. The exploitation is, is for performance. 
the exploration is to discover new things. And so there's, there's a trade-off there. Uh, and the, the key question of, for the explore exploit trade-off is how much should I explore to discover how best to perform in the future? All right, so this is, this is kind of the key thing which is going on as far as the actions that are being taken. And then if you do this in just the right way, it turns out that you can do something that's really amazing. So I'm expecting you just about everybody's familiar with A-B testing. You familiar with A-B testing? Yeah, okay, so, so there's, there's a trick here, and that trick is, turns out to be incredibly powerful in just the right situations. All right, so suppose that we have uh, a user who um, has some features. Maybe they're a teacher in Texas. Uh, and we want to choose, we have a policy which is going to choose um, some particular uh, article to display. So maybe it displays uh, a news article about space. Um, okay, so it's displayed to the user. The user reacts to this and then they read the article. That's great. Another user comes along. Uh, there's a policy, they have features, the policy's gonna make a choice. Uh, we're gonna do a, a food article this time. We keep going, that's a thread. Uh, another user, another choice, uh, it's ignored this time. Another user, another choice, it's read this time. And you can see that the features are varying with each of these individual users, and this continues on and on and on. Right? So for, for MSN scale applications, this would be like 10 million events per day. Right? And now suppose that I had a, a rule that I wanted to try. So in particular, maybe I have a career rule. The career rule says that if it's an engineer, you display a uh, space article, and if it's a uh, teacher, you display a food article. It's a, a rule you could try. What you can do is you can check back in your logs, and you can go, ah, two of those events, let's see, right here, agree with that rule. And I can use these events to evaluate as if I had done an A-B test. Okay, so that, that, that makes sense. And now I can say, ah, I'm gonna try a location rule. Maybe people in Texas get the space articles and people in Seattle get the food articles, right? And now I have three events that agree with this rule. And now if you're looking closely, you realize this is not A-B testing because the fourth event right here matches both of those rules. Right, so this seems like a, a, a minor blip. But this is actually a very major blip because it allows you to do amazing things. Right, so you can test using the same events. Now there are, there are some statistical limits here, to, just to be fair. Uh, but the statistical limits here are uh, something like with the data for 21 A-B tests, you can test a billion rules. It's an, it's an exponential tail type of structure, if you're interested in that. So you can, you can do a very large number of evaluations on the data and still have reliable results that, that come out. Okay, so I wanna compare an A-B testing paradigm to the counterfactual ev evaluation paradigm. So in A-B testing, what happens is you have your two rules, location versus profession. You, you test them side by side. Half the traffic gets one, half the traffic gets the other. You see which does the best. And, and then you choose whichever one does the best and you throw away your data. That's, that's roughly it. Um, so you use the data once to make one decision. In the counterfactual evaluation approach, you're using a reinforcement learning policy which is exploring over alternatives. And I'm glossing over details. You have to log things quite carefully to do this effectively, but the system does that automatically. Uh, and now you can, you can run experiments on that data over and over and over again. And each of these experiments is equivalent to having done an A-B test at the time you're collecting the data. All right, so you use the A-B testing data once, you can use the uh, counterfactual evaluation data 100,000 times, a million times. There's no real limit to how often you can use this data. Right? So that's, this, this, is, this has changed the way that I think about how many things should be done. 
A-B testing, A-B testing, to be clear, is not obsolete. There are other reasons than optimization to use A-B tests, right? It's good for safety, right? Um, but uh, if you're trying to optimize through an A-B test, you're, you're not doing it right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, um, well, I was going to add something uh, there that in the first case where you have the humans coming up with an idea, oh, let's try this and let's do an A-B test, there's an inherent lag in that loop, which is somebody coming up with an idea, somebody configuring that A-B test, waiting to collect data, right? And how, how fast can you do that? Maybe you can compress it to somebody coming up with an idea and coding it and testing it to a week, right? I mean, do you folks deploy like a new A-B test every week? Maybe you have a larger team and you have a better infrastructure and you're applying all these A-B testing, large control infrastructure, so maybe you can push 10 A-B tests in a day? Maybe you are going crazy and you do 100? That's still not digital speed. Somebody has to come up with the idea, has to invest, has to code the A-B test, has to t- learn a mo- teach a model for the A or the V, and then do a comparison. This is fully digital. Like it's um, basically the counterfactual evaluation is using the past as a counterfactual simulation of what would have happened. We can't simulate users, but what we can simulate is how well a policy would have worked based on the data that is there. The other thing which I think is really important here is because you have this ability to do counterfactual evaluation, that actually is the core thing enabling enabling reinforcement learning. You have this signal, which is equivalent to an A-B test. If you optimize for that signal, you will do better. Right? So when we want to work with a data set, we work with uh, an appropriately logged data set so we can ha- do these counterfactual evaluations. We optimize our policy, and then we deploy it, and you know it works because we knew it would work. Right. And the personalizer service does all that logging for you just by doing the rank reward call and the way I mentioned the event hubs, there's metadata that stores this probability distribution functions and other things that it just does. So this can be done with a button. All right, so this is, uh, this is what it looks like in terms of a, of a dashboard. Maybe you have data accruing over time and now you can look at what the performance of the current model is, the, the online performance that you're getting. You can look at the baseline. Um, so maybe there's some uh, existing system which is also making choices. Uh, you're overriding those with, with the personalizer, trying to get a little bit more performance. You can ask how well does that perform, right? And then you can also look at what, what would happen if you had a random policy, just choose, chose randomly amongst your actions. And then you can also ask what would happen if I changed the way that I did the learning how much better would my performance get? You can do this, so this is four out of 100,000. I mean, you may not actually do 100,000, but you get the idea, right? You're free to try out many different things much more rapidly than you could even possibly imagine, ever imagine with an A-B testing-like approach. Mm-hmm. And I think the point there is that we, we do it for you. We actually turn a button where there's a toggle there and you say, yes, optimize thyself. And then we do take the, action to say, okay, let's find a better set of machine learning policies and set, sorry, settings that will create that higher curve. And when you mentioned we can measure against baseline, there's one trick we didn't say before, which is remember that array of actions we said you should send in? So there's a convention which we say the first action in the array, the you know, index zero, is the one you would have shown to the user if we didn't exist, right? And therefore we can use that and process in the counterfactual evaluation. Right, so um, this is just one of the examples where it's been applied at Microsoft. I mean, I think there's like over two dozen-ish. I'd say there's a dozen deployments. Deploy- production deployments of reinforcement learning for different purposes. Many of them are personalization. The Xbox example was um, around uh, personalizing the content type, right? So I don't know, I'm a completionist, right? So if you show me the achievement I'm gonna get next almost there, I'm gonna go, like, oh, I'm gonna get it now. Uh, other people just like seeing celebrities and you know, like seeing you know, displays of prowess on a mixer stream. Other folks just go whatever game where their friends are at. So personalizer um, was being used to help choose the right action type, you know, watch, play, uh, join your friends, et cetera, in the Xbox homepage. And that's an example at scale. We also, and, and it shows also that with the AI services that we're putting out from Microsoft, they're not, uh, like, they're not science experiments. Right, I mean, we, we, we bet revenue 
on this Xbox, Bing ads, and uh, SN News, and then there's like indirect revenue. Like we use this in our uh, technical support bots for Windows, right? And things like that, where the bot saves time from manual labor by understanding a more personalized suggestion to the user. And so the 40% lift is not, um, is, is very high. And that's considering that they have very good machine learning people. And those machine learning people are focused on getting the right features in. So they've up-leveled the, dial the dialogue, right? Instead of being there going like, okay, I know what you want, let me find data, train a model, et cetera. They're having a higher order discussion about what features are important, what things can we learn, and uh, it's a much better use of their time instead of going through that treadmill. Um, and it, with, with this also, I think, brings uh, something important for us. Um, you know, we're launching um, more and more advanced cognitive services that uh, make it really easy. You know, two lines of code, seven text box settings, and you have a reinforcement learning loop. Uh, with great power comes great responsibility. I mean, a, an AI algorithm that goes and tries to achieve the goal you give it is, is not something to be taking super lightly. And when you're talking about personalization, you're almost expecting a human to be on the other side who you are you know, influencing, who you are giving or not giving options to. And that also brings all sorts of ethical considerations. So we, we took this very seriously as part of our product life cycle, just like how you consider UX or security or scalability. We also considered responsible use and ethics as a cross-cutting concern throughout the life cycle with all sorts of checkpoints and things. We are putting effort into the tools so that you don't have to be like a Python master to extract explainability out of a model. We think it should just be a UI. If you're coding against this in any language, you should be able to see what features matter and how well things work. Um, with a research team, there was a lot of work to make it reproducible. So there's a lot of like uh, pseudo random things happening. Do we explore or do we exploit, right? Do we try this or that? If you use the right event, if you use event IDs that you supply, we have reproducibility of all the seed of the random number generator. So you know that if you use that same model, that same policy, two years later, it will generate the same output and you can have an auditability and explainability component. Um, and most importantly, maybe we are helping you understand the possible impacts, positive and negative, uh, unintended consequences of using personalization this powerful uh, with people. Like for example, what, sh when should you use personalizer at all? There's some things that are consequential effects. And uh, one a typical example is do not use personalizer to choose what um, insurance policy to show to somebody or not. Why? Because the reward of what is a good insurance policy for somebody, the financial safety of like pooled risk, is not something you measure in a click. It's not something you measure like you know, 30 seconds in. It's something you might measure 10 years in if ever, right? Um, if you're gonna be using, um, explore, exploit, when is it ethical to explore? Like we were talking uh, with you know, big medical companies and like, hey, uh, if you're changing a medical device behavior, when does the user need to opt in to say like, yeah, you might sometimes change my device to behave in the way that is not the one you believe is the most optimal given what you know, right? And what is the human in the loop sort of like opt-in that needs to happen? And same thing with proxying and bias. Um, if you're using features for things, they might become uh, proxies for uh, other attributes that you don't want to personalize for. For example, in the US, a race is very segregated by zip code. GIP gives you zip code like that, and now you start personalizing by zip code, and you're introducing uh, potential racial bias in your model. So um, we, we try to give examples and counterexamples and checklists in, um, in the tool itself, in the documentation of the product, so you can ask yourself these questions and like, evaluate them, and just like you can suggest um, product features and samples you want in our user voice online you know, forum, you can also ask questions and, and, and ask for more content around these topics. Well, I mean, that's, okay. so, Takeaways, personalizers here. You can almost or use it. Yes. <laughs> uh, there are radical productivity gains to be had over using A-B testing for optimization. That, that's, that's really important, I think. I think the future, because this is, this is a huge improvement, the future is gonna look a lot more like this. And then reinforcement learning actually gives you ways to solve problems that you basically just couldn't solve otherwise. 
There's, there's no good way. You, basically, you face a choice. Your resource is, is sample complexity. There's the, the interactions that you have. You can choose to use this, this sample complexity in a, in a very low information way, or you can choose to use it in a, in a high information way. And, and uh, I mean, obviously, you can do much better if you use it in a high information way. All right, so here's some pointers. Uh, the personalizer is aka.ms slash personalizer. You can give feedback and uh, personalize your user voice. And then there's a tutorial that uh, Alec Agarwal and myself did at ICML in uh, two ICMLs ago, um, uh, which has a lot of the research details around this, and, as well as a lot of pointers into uh, further information. All right, so All right. we're done, thank you. Um, questions? Yeah, open dialogue, questions. Um, no. I am uh, Dave Clinton, and I love your book, Why Software Sucks. Um, I was uh, curious about your A and B. One of the things that I, that I like in Why Software Sucks, um, there, there's these guys, uh, Carbonite, who make the backup service, uh, internet backup service. And I was uh, asking them, how effective their advertising was, and they had run an A-B test. And in the one, they, they showed a guy lying in the hammock sipping lemonade because um, Carbonite was backing up his disk. He didn't have to worry about it. Really, they showed a bad guy attacking the disk and Carbonite fighting it off. And very much, they sold a lot more when they showed the attack ad than the guy lying back ad. And, 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 and you're saying that if they had done this instead, they'd have gotten even better? Than that. Potentially. So if they had done this instead, yes. then potentially, they, maybe some people respond to the lying back ad uh, better than uh, the, the fighting ad. Oh, absolutely. So, some and, of them would have been. And so potentially, you could deliver the best ad to each individual person. I see. So that was an observation. What worked better than nothing? This one can actually act. It can predict which one is the one that you want to show well, based on some feature. Show Bob the lemonade and show George the, uh, the attack. Is that, is, is that done? Right, exactly. Yeah. So you, the, the information needs to be there. So for, for the features that you send in, there needs to be some kind of information on those features which can allow the system to conclude that, that the, uh, the sleeping ad is better than the fighting ad for this person. But if that information is there, it, it, it can happen. And th so the ceiling on your performance goes up as you personalize. That, that's kind of the key thing that personalization gives you. For example, uh, an aggregate feature, if you have some information about your users and you're trying to get them to renew their Carbonite license, you could look at their email. Is it like at Gmail, at Hotmail, whatever? Or is it at you know, some corporation, Contozo.com? And that might just tell you what sort of attitude they have towards risk and data and things like that and make a better decision. There's another question. Yeah. Thanks, Dave. Hi, I'm just curious. Is the result of the rank algorithm just one set of action? That's the best one? Or can we get more than one recommendation? So I'm thinking more along the line of recommender system where you know, like, this is multiple articles you can uh, look at and then and give the reward for you know, what the user chose from one of those. Yeah, so there's, there's a, a, a lot of complexity around that, around the answer to that. Um, Okay, so first of all, rank actually does do a sort. Uh, so it will produce an ordering, uh, where that ordering is, is mostly determined by, by sort of the exploit version of things. Uh, with that said, you're only really giving feedback about the, the top thing in, in the current system. Now, with that said, uh, we are also uh, creating a modified version right now, which allows, which essentially runs reinforcement learning for each thing that gets returned, dependent upon the other things, which allows you to give direct feedback for each of the individual, if you, if you want to display a set of things. That's not in the system yet, but um, you know, we're working on that. If you're, if you're interested in the code behind this, Vopal Wabbit is an open source uh, on GitHub. This, this is the, the core code behind this, it's, as far as the learning goes. And you can see it's, it's the CCB branch where this work is going on right now. Right. Yeah. Derivative from the, the, the question that um, was asked just now, I had an additional question. I was reading the documentation 
He said that in the documentation says that uh, best performance is done uh, under 50 uh, items in the catalog. And I was thinking around the, the example that uh, you guys were talking about the news. It's easy for you to have for recommendations. In, in that example, for instance, the catalog of news for the last hour would be easily above uh, 50 items. So how, how do you work around that? Yeah, so uh, for MSN, uh, there's actually editors who choose what the top 20 articles are. Okay. So there's, some, there's the curation step curation. For, 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 for choosing what those are. Um, and and that, that actually adds a lot of safety to the system because uh, you, you don't want to, yeah, so it's easy to imagine things that are very clickbaity that you don't actually want to display, right? So, so, so this, this helps. There's another mechanism that I've often seen, which is often people use a supervised recommendation system to boil things down to uh, the top 10, 20, 50, or whatever. And then you can do personalization on top of that to increase your, your maximum performance. So let's say you have a recommendation engine that does SAR or something like that and takes the interactions of people with products, collaborative filtering, whatever you might have, right? And that, you can think of that as getting in the ballpark. Right, of like, okay, here's the 30 things. And what you do is then you daisy chain. You like take the list of things that this gave you, and then you put them through personalizer, and personalizer can take into account all those wacky attributes like wa battery level that your recommendation engine typically won't, right? And do that kind of like last step, precision personalization, and then you know, it will deliver, it'll learn Right? based on the attributes of things. So it doesn't need to be the same 30 things every time. It's just like the attributes have to stay consistent over time, the features of your actions. And then it also has the benefit, because it is doing the explore exploit, when it's doing explore, it might find a new thing, then that will be logged, and then like the next day or whenever, your supervised learning or collaborative filtering or whatever systems will pick up as data to improve themselves as well. So it almost kind of like it makes both systems work better if you put it at the end. That means that the actions can change from one request to another. Right. Like I might be getting like a... The total catalog is 50 for one given point. Also. Let's say I have half a million products in my catalog. I use a collaborative filtering or whatever to boil it down to 20, just to give an example. And those, each one of those 20 has attributes. And we rank, and we return a personalized option. Next user comes along. They get another totally different 20 products, but they have some of the similar attributes, right? And the model learns on the attributes of the things, not the ID of the thing. Thank you. Yeah. And there's a. How about um, hierarchical choices or structures, like choice one, choice two, choice three, where only know basically this, this, the reward of choice one after I'm done with the, the third choice? that be done in basically three separate models for each choice, or would you have like a bigger one with a step ID or hierarchy ID? Where yeah, you so <laughs> so the, the answer here is a little bit tricky. The, the timing of when you know the reward is not really that important. The fact that you can tie the reward to the action is important. So if you have three actions, each of which is affecting the reward that you observe, then it gets it's, it's complex. Mm -hmm. if, it, if, on the other hand, you, you take three actions, uh, so first of all, by the way, you, you can control the pseudo-randomness by controlling the event, uh, the event ID, right? So you, that, what that means is that you can make sure that the randomization for those three events is orthogonal. That's important. Mm -hmm. And now if you can figure out what the reward is for each of those three events, you can just have three different loops, and they can each run independently, and they will each optimize in the context of the decisions that the other ones make. Mm -hmm. One thing is, for example, if you're showing a web page, and you say, I'm going to personalize everything. I'm going to like, max it out. I'm going to like, personalize which article to show and what photo to choose for the article. I'm going to choose a layout. It's not good to have like, three loops independently going on this, because then if the user clicked, how do you know whether it was the layout, the picture, the article? It's super hard to assign it. So what we recommend people do is that they boil typical combina combinations of these, kind of like this news with this layout, with this picture, that news with that picture, with that layout down to 30 possible combinations, and then just have those you know, choice of picture, choice of layout as features, right? So you're doing the pre-mixing of all the options, and then you have a very simple credit or like reward to give to that combination and those features, and it simplifies things a lot. We do that in our, in our surface.com retail sites where we choose different layouts and things based on a personalizer. Any other questions?
Yeah. I was just thinking, trying to think of the right way to phrase the question, but um, is there anything built into the service right now for uh, versioning your model? So yeah. say you know, well, yeah, once it, once you get to a certain point, okay, like I want to I want to kind of kind of take a snapshot here, and now I want to try some try some try something else wacky, like add a bunch more attributes, mm -hmm. and I'll crap that over train to this one particular response, and now I can roll that back. Yeah, so we, we didn't want to have like the whole source code control of models inside the tool. So right. what we do is we provide an API and a user interface okay. where you can download both the model and the policies and import the policies and upload the model coming soon. But let's say you wanted to just have a business asset that you store weekly, which is the model of that week, right. or you wanted to go and party on with Vopal Wabbit and like go total machine learning crazy on it. Right? Uh, and you can do that offline, and it's your asset. So you can download it, and via an API, yeah. then you can put in whatever storage versioning things you folks might like. Right, okay, so yeah, it's, 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 it'd be fairly easy to take and say, okay, I wanna, I wanna grab a copy of this, store it in Git, and then uh, you know, mm -hmm. go, off and, go yeah. off and try something weird, and if it doesn't yeah. work. Yeah, one principle we're trying to follow is that everything we're doing in the UI goes through the same admin API that you have access to. So uh, it's, it's kind of a principle. And uh, one of the things that people have built at Microsoft on top of that sort of stuff is that they actually take a model and they run a pre-validation counterfactually, right? Is this the, so they run a pre-validation counterfactually and before saying, okay, push it as a live one, just to make sure they're not like pushing out some really like ugly, non-working thing, right? So you they pull it out, you test it counterfactually elsewhere offline with data, and then you do a push of the model live. And you could build those rich things with the APIs. Cool, thanks. But if you're doing that sort of cool things, let us know in the user voice because we want to add more APIs that make it easy to, to manage the life cycle. Are you looking into things where the response might be like a float, for example, for color temperature or positioning on the screen or something like that? Yes. <laughs> yes. If you're uh, really interested in the research, there's a paper at Colt uh, coming out June 25th. Is, is when the conference is. But nothing to announce at this point. Maybe. Yeah. It, it, it'll be a while before it's in the, any kind of system. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you, folks.